on the ballad records well, label. Move to post-war section now. Oh, thank you, Jack. That's right. Post-war section. Uh, Joe Alexander and the Cubans. Lot number 5484, $150. Now, just because we moved to post-war and out of the gym quality section does by no means mean that we are out of the gym quality records. We bought a stellar collection last year of post-war material. I mean, top shelf stuff. And we featured some of it last auction. We've got a lot of it in this auction. We have more coming. Uh, mo most of this collection is in beautiful gym quality collection. The guy sent me a spreadsheet of what he had and I looked it over, but you never know what the conditions would look like. He said it was good. I hear that all the time. I flew into uh, uh, his town. I went to see the stuff. I just pulled out some of the better records at random. And after spending about 10 minutes, 4,000 records there, I said, we've got a deal. I already knew what he wanted. I said, I don't have to worry about the condition. Uh, you grade right. Um, so there was no surprises. I, we just loaded up the whole thing and went through it once I got here. But I already knew what was in there. So uh, that's, that's a nice way to do a deal. You know, you know what you're going for. He knows what he's got. You know what he's got. We come to an agreement on the price. We move the records. I'm out of his hair. He's got the cash, and I'm on my way. So uh, that's, uh, that's what happened then. Got another uh, trip coming up. I may, I may be on it while you're watching this. I'm heading up uh, the East Coast up into New England. Got several really primo collections I'm going to be checking out. Uh, it's been a while since I've been on the road because of the whole COVID situation. People haven't been able to get together or didn't want people coming in their house. Uh, but now that's largely over, thank God. And uh, we're starting to do business again. So, um, so there should be some pretty cool stuff coming up in future catalogs. So to be on the lookout. Getting back to our post-war section. Uh, we already did that record. Let's move on to the next one. Apollo label uh, 5486. E minus condition of Billy Austin and his hearts. $150 minimum bid. The Teenage Record Company, $54.88, $50 for the Baltineers. Here's a media recording, $54.96, $300 minimum bid by Sonny Blair. Please send my baby back. What does that say on there? Oh, uh, Jack writes that the apparent stress grooves are just loud pr passages, and they sound great. This is an E-conditioned record. You know, sometimes on these records, you have such uh, dynamics going on in the grooves because of just the volume, the drums or the trumpet or whatever it might be, uh, that they look like they're worn when they're really not worn at all. It's just the way the light reflects off the grooves. Okay, lot number 5507 for $150, Eddie Boyd. Save her doctor on J-O-B. Uh, Colonial Records, Big Charlie Bradix, 5508 for $500. Chess recording of Jackie Brinston, My Real Gone Rocket, with his Delta Cats, 5509, $500 E plus gym quality recording of that. Perfect record. 5511, $400 minimum bid for John Brim and his combo doing Strange Man. E minus copy, 5512, $500. John Brim Trio, Trouble in the Morning on JOB Blue Label. Parrot recording of John Brim doing uh, the Gary Stomp. 5514, E condition, 700. Is that 750 or 775? It's like $75. $75? Okay, I'll take your word for it. Seventy-five dollars. Club fifty-one, Honey Brown, ain't no need. Fifty-five nineteen, one hundred and fifty dollars. Jack's going to check that. Uh, fifty-five twenty-six, the Buckeyes on Deluxe, Dottie Baby, fifty dollars. Fifty-five twenty-six, fifty-five fifty. One hundred dollar minimum bid on the Grand Label, the Castells. Ace Records, fifty-five ninety-eight, fifty dollar minimum bid. Big Boy Crudup, fifty-five ninety-nine, seventy-five by, for the Crystals on Deluxe. Fifty-six oh one hundred dollars for the Daffodils, and Carl Jones doing Wine on CJ Records. Here we have five hundred dollar minimum bid for the 
first recording, first issued record by Fats Domino. We played this side on the uh, on the Bitter Request show, The Fat Man. That's slot number 5618. This is a great record, too. It is a Just great musically, record. It was really fun. And uh, historically significant. Here is 5635, $50 minimum bid on the Red Robin label by the Dew Droppers. Go back. Let me go ahead and put these out of the way. All right. The Dubs. On the Gone label, man, Gone, fifty-six thirty-six for fifty dollars. Here's another copy of the Dubs, lot number fifty-six thirty-seven. Such loving, fifty dollars. Ebony Records, lot number fifty-six forty, fifty dollars. And fifty-six forty-five, Sun Recording by Billy the Kid Emerson, seventy-five dollar minimum bid, E minus condition. All right, last section of crate number four is uh, Jubilee by the Enchanters. $56.46, $50. Here's Blue Lake by the Fascinators. $56.49, $150. your copy. Well, actually, it's my copy, but... Could be your Could copy. be your copy. Fifty-six fifty-one for one hundred and fifty dollars a uh, uh, sample pressing of that. Okay, fifty-six fifty-nine fifty dollars is the five echoes so lonesome on Saber. Parrot fifty-six seventy-one two hundred fifty dollars for the five thrills. Fifty-six seventy-two. Another record by the Five Thrills for one hundred and fifty dollar minimum. Here is the Allen record by uh, Don Archer with the Five Willows, one hundred dollar minimum bid. Fifty-six seventy-three. Fifty-six seventy-four hundred dollar minimum bid by the Five Willows. Getting high by the flares. Fifty-six seventy-six for fifty dollars. You know you shouldn't be sniffing flares if you don't want to get high. Chance Records, the Flamingos, fifty-six seventy-seven for fifty dollar minimum bid. That's my desire. And if it is your desire, then put a bid in on it. Fifty-six seventy-eight, fifty dollars. The Flamingos on a promo Chance label. Parrot by the Flamingos on my merry way, fifty-six eighty, two hundred and fifty dollar minimum bid for that. E minus slash E condition. Fifty-six eighty one, one hundred dollars the Flamingos. Fifty-six eighty two, one hundred dollars the Flamingos. E minus. The four jacks on federal promo label, fifty-six eighty nine, fifty dollars. Uh, same deal, four jacks on uh, federal promo, $50, $56.90. Here's Mercury. Oh, this is a crazy record. The Four Plaid Throats, $56.91 for $50. We played that on a Bitter Request show. It's one of those records you just got to hear to believe. And we're still not quite sure what the message was. No. No, we aren't. It was uh, very... Very much delivered, though. It was uh, it was crazy. Checker, fifty six ninety five five hundred dollar minimum bid for Rocky Fuller and his guitar. Soon one morning. Looks like that was something where the label for the sides got messed up. Uh, soon label on both sides. So somebody put a little sticker on this side that says "Come on, baby." So yep, little label error there. $500 minimum bid, E minus. That's something that happens every once in a while. And then, you know, sometimes you'll have something where a disc is 
accidentally pressed with the same selection on both sides too. True. Though that's a little less common, but uh, yeah. Just or another... sometimes it's purposely pressed with the same thing on both sides, and some of those I haven't been able to really figure out the reason for. Yeah. All right, 5707, we have uh, Clarence Bonton Garlow doing Route 90, which passes right here through Houston. Great tune. $250 minimum bid. Very similar to Route 66, only uh, it uh, goes from New Orleans to say Los Angeles. Route 90. Anyway, 5717, $75 minimum bid on the Star Day label. This is Ducktail by Rudy Tootie Grazel. We were going to play that on the catalog on the bid request show. Didn't have time. Fifty-seven nineteen, one hundred dollar minimum bid by uh, Rudy Green. Highway number one. Well, highway number one could be just about anywhere. Highway one up California coast is pretty nice. If you don't hit a rock, rock slide. Fifty-seven thirty-eight, three hundred dollar minimum bid by Herbie Joe. Smokestack Lightning on Abco. Very different recording than the uh, Alan Wolf tune. All right. Take your word for it. Fifty-seven forty-two, fifty-dollar minimum bid by the Hollywood Flames. Ride hell and ride. You know you wouldn't want to be driving up Highway uh, One in California right now. I hear the diesel is like seven, seven dollars a gallon, maybe eight. And ride it up on your moped. That's why I'm heading the East Coast and not the West Coast. Fifty-seven forty-three, fifty dollars for the Hollywood Flames. There's a BJ record by John Lee Hooker, uh, $50 minimum bid for lot number 5747. $50 minimum bid for a vinyl pressing on VJ in E condition? That ain't make no sense. 5752 Shaky Horton on Cobra, $200 minimum bid. We are going to back up a little bit because we lost, we missed out on some records, some really high dollar stuff that had been put aside, which uh, I'm just going to clear out of the way first before we get into crate number five. Uh, lot number 5209 for $750 minimum bid is Curly Weaver, Tricks Ain't Walking No More. And uh, we have a Blind Willie Mattel accompaniment on this record. We played this on the Bitter Request Show. It's a very nice E minus condition recording of uh, Blind Willie Mattel. Get the shadow out of the way here. You can see how sweet that is. Boy, if all duckas look like that, huh? My goodness gracious. Plays very well. Good record. And somebody's going to be very happy. Here we have Andrew and Jim Baxter, Bamalong Blues. 5311 is the uh, lot number, a $2,500 minimum bid for an E-plus recording. Look at this. You know, these things that you see on here, this is just little dust particles. Don't get all concerned. Those are not needle digs. Look at that. Look at that. KC Railroad Blues. Andrew and Jim Baxter. Beautiful, beautiful record. And, look at this. Jack, it has the original dealer sleeve with that. Wow. 20962. Bamalong Blues right there. Which means that is very likely new old stock. May not have even been played until we played it on the Bitter Request Show. All right, now this is very likely new old stock as well, uh, especially knowing where I bought this record. Unfortunately, it does have a very light one-inch hair crack, which you can barely hear on one side. You don't hear on the other side. As I said in the Bitter Request Show, I'd much rather have a hair crack in a record than a grainy pressing or any number of other things that are just obnoxious to me noise-wise. A crack is not that big a deal, and you can easily eliminate a crack in post-processing uh, after you've digitized it. So I, cracks don't really bother me, and a tiny, very light one-inch hair crack, not at all. This is a lot number 5368. This is Get Fiddle Jim doing Rainy Night Blues on 23268. So Get Fiddle Jim, who's that, Jack? Um, James Arnold. Yeah, it's that guy. Also no, known as Kokomo Ar Arnold. This is a very scarce record. 473 copies sold. 
78 Quarterly estimates three copies known to exist. If there are only three copies known to exist, what can we say about the present copy? It's probably the best one. It is probably the best one. I would say there's a 99% chance of that being true. This is a $5,000 minimum bid on this very important, very rare recording. Oh, well, if there's three of them, then there would be a 33% chance. No. No, it'd be about a 99% chance because let's say there were 100 of them, there'd still probably only be one at grade Z plus. Uh, maybe three at grade Z plus. Because that's how rare E plus records are, yeah. at least the way we grade them. Did you slide that? Did you slide it out to show oh, everybody? No, should I? I probably should. The record. I had it zoomed out. I was already. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jack. You'll note that we do have it bound to the cardboard just to make sure that the crack doesn't. Uh, grow, but there's no reason that it should. Look at the condition of that. Look at that. Paddling blues on this side. Unbelievable. So, yeah, that is a record for somebody. You know something I should mention something while, while we're doing this. We sell these Discophile record sleeves. I know you guys are all familiar with them. All the records that we sell, as you can see, come in Discophiles. All right? There's a reason for that. It's because the Discophile sleeves are Stiff cardboard, as you can see, as I've been uh, dealing with them, they have information a block up here where you can record information pertinent to the record, uh, whatever is pertinent to you. Uh, and here's another couple of features of discophiles. Let me, uh, let me just grab a discophile here. So your discophiles are glued so that your seam is not on the, the, the paper is not on the outside. You notice how sometimes you'll pull a record out of your shelves and that little edge there will catch the record next to it and you don't even know it. You pull the record out and the record behind it falls on the floor and breaks. These are designed to prevent that from happening. So the edge of the paper is facing in this direction towards the back of the shelf so it's not going to catch on anything. That's a design feature. You'll notice that we don't have a cutout up here like other sleeves do because you've noticed when you go through a pile of records how you get the kind of the dusty, discolored kind of mucked up part of the record where that little half moon is and you can't even get rid of it sometimes because it's kind of etched into the record itself. This prevents that. This protects the entire record. Instead, what we have are these little cutouts, a notch on this side and one on this side. So whichever way you're holding the sleeve, when you go to put the record into the sleeve, it's very easy to get it in. You know how some of these sleeves are straight across the top? and you're sitting there trying to futz with it to try and get it in between the two pieces of paper and then you wind up dropping a record. It doesn't happen with Discophile. Now, it's not so much when you got it on a piece of cardboard, but you just put the record right there, the edge right right there in, in that little opening cutout, and you open up the sleeve and slide the record in. It's a design feature. Discophiles are the best record sleeves on the market. I'm not just saying that because we make them. It's just true. We these come in 11 different sizes, ranging from the five and a half inch little wonders that we showed you all the way up to the 16 inch uh, transcription records. We would have done 20 inch discophiles, but there are so few of those out there that uh, I didn't warrant it worth the expense. But anyway, we can get all the other sizes for you. So just a little promo on that. Jack has very kindly just sent a different record sleeve. Look at that. Look at how flimsy that is. Look at how the look at how the seam is over here with the paper on the outside. That's ridiculous. Who would want to use a sleeve like that anyway? And look at look at how I can see the part of the record sticking out there. That's just terrible. Get rid of that, Jack. Where are you handing it over here? You shouldn't even be here in the auction room. Unbelievable. All right. Now that's gone. Getting back to business. Slot number 5513. For a $1,000 opener, J-O-B, John Brim and his trio, Drinking Woman. Now, we played this on the Bitter Request Show, but we played the flip side, which says it's by John Brim and his trio, but it's actually by Sunnyland Slim overnight. So, anyway, important record, Jack. I'm going to give all these to you here in a minute. And uh, lot number 5791, The King's Men with Lefty Bates Band, Kicking with My Stallion. We played that on the Bitter Request Show. In fact, I think we played all of these. Uh, from 1957, $1,000 minimum bid on the Club 51 Record Company label. Uh, we played this one by Roxy, lot number 5876, $2,500 minimum bid on that record, Good Night My Love by the Musketeers. But we didn't play that side, we played the side by the Mosquitoes. Love You Till My Dying Day. So you'll see that the 
took one of the E's, it should have been over here, and they moved it over here, and it's the Mosquitoes. So I'm just throwing that out. That's probably worth a lot, of, lot more money. I don't know. Were they all like that? I don't know. Never seen this record before. This is a very rare record. Somebody told me a copy of this uh, sold for 8500 bucks on one of Tef Teller's lists back in the 1990s. I don't know. I didn't buy it. But this is a $2,500 minimum bid, so you may get it for a bargain. Or it may go for more than 8500 I don't know. Fifty-seven, fifty-four. Soldier Boy Houston. Hug Me Baby. Uh, $100 minimum bid. Go ahead, Jack, and take that handful. Getting back to uh, crate four is what we're doing. Lot number 57.57 for a $100 minimum bid. Howlin' Wolf on chess. 57.58, Howlin' Wolf on RPM. Morning at midnight, $200 minimum. E condition pressing. Here's Elmore J James and his broom dusters on flare, hand in hand, 57.68, E minus, 100 bucks. Another James flare, late hours at midnight, 57.69. So we just had morning after midnight and late hours at midnight. Take your pick, $100 minimum bid. Or buy both. Buy both. The Jayhawks on flash, love train. $50 minimum, $57.72. The Jets on Aladdin, $250 minimum, $57.76. As I blow spittle all over my record sorting thing here. $50 minimum, $57.82. Little Sonny Jones on Imperial. That's a nice uh, vinyl copy there. I hope so. <laughs> Uh, $250, $57.86 by Arthur or Albert King, Parrot Label. Oh, this is a rare and important record. Here's B.B. King on Bullet, one of his very first recordings, $250 minimum bid, lot number 5787. Uh, we should have played that. It's in V++ condition, uh, but it's a very, very rare record. Uh, if that had not been V++, that would have easily been a $1,000 minimum bid record. Not that V++ is bad. I don't want to be saying that. Here's a V++ record. All right. Yeah, usually V++ records have very little audible wear. Well, especially the post-war stuff. You know, this post-war stuff, as you guys probably know who collect it, it can look like, you know, somebody's played it with a, uh, a darning pin and, and sound almost perfect. This is, uh, you can see some graying in the grooves here, okay? So it's not brand new by any means. But it's a this particular record is very clean. Look at that. Not a bunch of scratches and scuffs and chips and marks and so forth. It's really a very, very nice V++. Uh, but this is going to sound absolutely great. All right, so that's, uh, that's what a V++ looks like. Okay, back to business. Jax. Oh, Jax. The Kings, baby, be there. Fifty-seven so, uh, ninety for fifty dollar minimum bid. Where we had the broom record with the little spindle hole in the O. Mm -hmm. So the spindle hole makes the, uh, the little bell of the saxophone. How about that? Kind of cute. Music goes round and round, and it comes out there. Fifty-eight oh two fifty dollar minimum bid by J. B. Lenoir, Eisenhower Blues. Ernest Lewis on Parrot, 5803 for $50, $58.19. Uh, Little Walter's very first recording, That's All Right, on the Chance label. It was originally issued on Oranel, so this is a later pressing, but it's still his very first record on Chance. We played this on the Bitter Request Show, we talked about it, we talked about him, and that is a $500 minimum bid. We also played this record, Dust My Broom, by Eddie Lockwood Jr., who actually learned guitar as a child from Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson was married to uh, uh, Robert Lockwood's mother. This is lot number 5821 for $250 minimum bid. Not really the sort of thing that you expect to see on Mercury. All right, lot number 5827 is Bill Mack, Star Day. Fat Woman, $250. Here's Blue Lake, The Maples. 
Lot number 5829, $250. 99 guys. Were we talking about, were we talking about playing that on a bit of request show at one point? I don't remember about that one. I think we were. The Marbles. We went to the from the Maples to the Marbles. Big Wig Walk. $200 minimum bid on Lucky. Lot number 5830. You want to make sure you win that record. Because otherwise, yeah. you'll have lost your marbles. Oh. Yeah, Jack, that's true. That's true. All right. Okay. What's up next, Bruce? The Master Tones, lot number 58, 33 for 100 bucks. Very attractive label. Look at that. Wow. That's, that's stunning. All right. Apollo, Mellow Dots, 58, 44, $50. Tin Pan Alley. I love you only by the Mellow Harps. Very clean copy, fifty-eight forty-five fifty dollars. Here's another Mellow Harps. Fifty-eight forty-five fifty dollars. Looks like a second copy of that. Somebody's going to be some, some two people are going to be happy. Fifty-eight forty-six fifty dollar minimum bid on the JD label. Fifty dollars for the Mellows with Lillian Leach. Here's uh, Big Maceo Merriweather on lot number 5850 for $250. Strange to Meet Blues on Fortune. Modern Hollywood, the Native Boys doing Native Girl. $500 minimum bid for that baby. Lot number 5877. I think we may have played that on the show. Robert Nighthawk and his Nighthawks band on United. $5878, $50. Big Town, writing on label. The Ontarios, 5882. That's obviously out of a uh, radio station. $100 minimum bid. Another nice vinyl pressing. Please don't bend the vinyl. Okay. 5883, $75 minimum for the Opals. The Orioles on Jubilee, that's fairly common. But nice e conditioned copy of To Be To You, $100 for $58.84. Argo label, the Pastels, $200 minimum bid for an e conditioned copy of Been So Long, lot number 58.93. 58.95 is a parrot label, the Pelicans, $250 minimum bid. Sun label the prisoners recorded in prison. Fifty nine oh six seventy five dollars. Right, Jack, recorded in prison, huh? Um, well, I think, think that was recorded in prison, Jack. Or at least they uh, were in prison, like at the time of the recording. Um, That's yeah. almost saying the same thing. Almost, yeah, just about. Okay, parrot. Snooky Pryor, Crosstown Blues, seventy five dollars for fifty nine oh seven. I don't know. Maybe they weren't in prison. Maybe they, uh, maybe they went to the studio. Maybe they got a work release. Maybe so. I, I, I don't can't remember. quite remember. It's been I don't couple, remember. It's been a couple been, shows. It's since been we a while. That's right. Yeah, been we at talked least two shows. We talked all about that not too long ago. Fifty nine oh nine. One hundred dollars for the rainbows on Rama. That's not your Rama's record. King label of uh, Robert Richard. Wigwam woman on fifty nine. $59.34 for $150. Oh boy, somebody stuck a label on this thing. Look at that. It's pitiful. $59.38, minimum bid $50 for Walter Robertson, Sputterin' Blues. $59.46, The Robins on Spark. I love Paris. Oh, that, that, uh, we that, played that. Yeah. Yeah, that is another really, really weird record. I love weird records. Fifty-nine, fifty-five. Some of my favorite records are weird records. Otis Rush and his band, Violent Love. $150 minimum bid on Cobra. Jimmy Rushing with Frank Cully and his band, Mr. Five by Five. Fifty-nine, fifty-six, seventy-five dollars Aladdin Records, The Shawees. You gotta love that name. 
$250 just because they're the Shawis. Uh, advanced copy for disc jockey, jockey use only. 5968, the Skylarks on a uh, Deca. Ooh, vinyl Deca. 5968. Spark, the Sly Fox. 5969 for $50. Here is uh, Henry Smith and his Blue Flames on promo dot. $100 for 5970. Aladdin, Thunder Smith, uh, 5972. You know, uh, this has Lightning Hopkins on guitar and uh, Thunder on piano. And we played this, or one of them, in a re re bit of request show. Talked about how they uh, were making their first recordings uh, for the Atlanta, uh, first recordings, period, I believe. And uh, they decided, the guys in the studio decided to call them Thunder and Lightning. That's how Lightning Hopkins got his name. The Solitaires on Old Town, $59.75, $150. Looks like we may have played that. $59.78, Otis Spann, checker. $500 minimum bid, E plus, E minus copy. $59.79 by the Sparrows on the Davis label, $100. Love Me Tender. Take note of the note. That is not the Elvis tune. Fifty-nine eighty-six. Arby Stidham, Abco. What do you want to bet that they recorded that after the Elvis tune, just so that they could sell some records to unsuspecting yeah, maybe. record buyers? Arby Stidham, When I Find My Baby, two hundred fifty dollars minimum bid for fifty-nine eighty-six. Fifty-nine eighty-nine is Sunny Land Slim and his Playboys on J.O.B. Four Day Bounce. Okay. All right. Uh, Sunnyland Slim on Mercury ain't nothing but a child. Fifty nine ninety for fifty dollars. Six thousand and one. Fifty dollars for Johnny Torrance. Living from day to day on R and B. Joe Turner on Atlantic. Fifty dollars, six thousand and nine. Joe Turner on Atlantic, six thousand thirteen, one hundred dollars. Oak Shimok Shipop, that's a pretty good record. Rockin' by Roosevelt Wardell with Ed Wiley's orchestra, so undecided. Sixty forty, one hundred dollars. Drum and label, Baby Boy Warren, seventy five dollars for sixty forty two. Gotham label, Baby Boy Warren, $60.43 for $150. Here's Muddy Waters on chess, Trouble No More, $60.51 for $50. Only $50 for an E-conditioned Muddy Water chess. The Wheels on premium, $50, lot number 60.58. That had been pulled for the Bitter Request Show. I don't think we made it that far. $60.59, The Whispers on Gotham. Doing full heart, fifty dollar minimum bid. And Sunny Boy Williamson, bopping with Sunny on Ace Records, fifty dollars. Lot number sixty sixty four. Sunny Boy Williamson trumpet, one hundred and fifty dollars, or maybe that's just fifty dollars for sixty sixty seven. And last seventy eight here is Johnny's mandolin. Doing Worried Man Blues on Ornell. And that is 6086 for $100. What you see here on the label was actually in the pressing. That, I think that's just little pieces of shellac flake or something that got on the label. That's, a, that's actually pressed in. Uh, we don't have that on this side, Money Taking Woman. All right, so that takes care of our 10 inch. 78 in auction 71. Here is a uh, Le Regret or Regret, I'm not sure how we would say that by uh, Mayol on uh, Apga label. That's out of our French section, lot number uh, 1452 for uh, $50. A little picture uh, of his impressive pompadour there on. Huh? On the uh, side one there, somebody posted, pasted a label. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, look at that, man. That guy's doing a wave. Looks like me when I wake up in the morning. Yeah, 
looks like he fell out of bed and hit his head on the floor. <laughs> All right, here is a... Uh, now this is a cool label. I mean, as, as far as cool labels are concerned, this is pretty cool. The uh, Society uh, of the Sinophone of Musica, Disc Leoni, uh, by Henri Weber, or Weber, a Paris recording on an 11 and a half or 10 and a half inch uh, disc, $250 minimum bid for $14.56. Just look at that Wuhan bat up there. Isn't that great? Man, if one of those things was flying at you, it's time to time to vacate the premises. You just know he's carrying something. All right, and here is oh this, I hated to get rid of this, but I guess there comes a time. All right, so this record is by Faircore. This is a phonotypia record, fairly typical looking phonotypia, although it does have a very low uh, serial number, number forty eight. Uh, phonotypias were serial numbered, so each one of these pressings would have a different serial number. That was in order to keep track of artist royalties. The serial number is not always the same on both sides, so here we have number 50. I'm not exactly sure that why that is. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. One would think, well, if that's what's going on, then they must be uh, pairing different sides together for that to happen. And sometimes that is the case. Sometimes you do see phonotypias paired differently, but that's not all that common really so I'm not exactly sure I, I can't explain that but that's not really the important thing about this uh, here's a, a Buenos Aires uh, Casa uh, Tagini uh, dealer's tag on there which is very nice uh, and here's Faircore's uh, stamped signature on the label no, no big deal all of them would be stamped with that so that's not that big deal but uh, who was Faircore who, who is that masked man well, I don't know but we have a clue. Here's a record sleeve, original record sleeve, phonotypia sleeve, got some tape on it. Look at that. There's Mr. Faircore himself. Finally, we can figure out who Mr. Faircore is. Or maybe we can't. I wonder how long it took him to grow that. <laughs> well, that's his upturned overcoat collar with his little bowler hat on. Baritono Faircore. I just love this because Faircore is a pseudonym for Ferrucci, Ferruccio Corradetti. In fact, if we look under here, under the uh, artist uh, recording for Phonotypia, and we go down here, they're alphabetical. Here we have Ferruccio Corradetti right here. Faircore. So that is his pseudonym. And I just love it how the guys at Phonotypia had such a great sense of humor. They weren't taking themselves so seriously that they could put this picture on here just acknowledging the fact that this mystery man isn't exactly who he's all cracked up to be. I think that's wonderful. As, and it's, you know, you might expect to see that maybe on a 1950s record. You know, you, you find record sleeves where people are having fun and so forth. Yeah, like Moondog. Like Moondog. You know, just funny records and so forth. But, uh, but to find that on a on a phonotypia sleeve, phonotypia, that was for those of you guys who aren't aware, who don't collect opera records, that was like the primo label back then. I mean, yeah, you had the GNT company and you had or the Gramphone company, you had RCA or not RCA, the Victor Talking Machine company, and no, those were certainly primo labels. But 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 this the Society of uh, Italians uh, basically. The Italian Society of Phonotypia. Um, this was like an artist conglomerate. These were great opera singers who came together to kind of do their own record company. And these are very significant artists, many of them very, very important artists. And I just love the fact that they did that. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Katerina Fleischer Adel, uh, Sinta's Ballad, Parts 1 and 2 from uh, uh, Der Fliegende Holländer. Lot number 1959, $100 minimum bid. A uh, little bit of a needle run on that label, but uh, very nice. Okay, Victor Morel on a uh, Phonotypia, $250 minimum bid, 1961 is the lot number on that. And here's a Phonotypia by uh, Emil Skarenberg from Fedora. Lot number 1964, $100 minimum bid. Very nice uh, phonotypia uh, tax stamp up here. 
This is pretty cool. This is another Scaremberg recording. Lot number 1965. Look at this. Serial number two. This is the second copy of this side that was sold. I do have, back here on the shelf somewhere, a serial number one phonotypia, which, you know, who cares, but I just think it's cool. $100 minimum bid for this. And here is one more of the uh, Disc Leone uh, bat labels. Again, by uh, Henri uh, Weber. Weber. Henri Weber. Uh, lot number 1968, $250 minimum. And, I, and this one we did play on the uh, auction uh, bid request show as well. We are going to uh, look at one more uh, recording from the operatic section. Another 10 and a half inch pressing on the Odeon Simplex label. Really attractive red, white, and blue uh, color scheme. Uh, this is a label that very, very important artists uh, were released on. This is Jean LaSalle. And uh, it's got a $2,000 minimum bid, lot number 1960. We played this on the Bitter Request Show. Uh, just a very, very record. It, it does come with a uh, Disc Odeon uh, record sleeve, but n I don't think that this is actually the, the correct Odeon sleeve for it. I think this is the sleeve is later than the record. All right, now let's do one more thing here. Uh, we have things kind of tucked in different places, so not everything that we're doing here in this uh, in these videos is by any means in order necessarily. Um, and this is one of those things that just kind of we missed. So we're that's what lot numbers are for, though. You can still go back in your catalog and find it. Yeah, on its appropriate page. You certainly can, and if you were fixing to do that, you would probably want to look up lot number thirty-two fifty-nine because we have this really nice series of Brunswick recordings. You'll see that that is the Brunswick Collector Series reissue label. Here's Al Hopkins and his Buckle Brusters, which would have originally been released on a, uh, a three-digit lightning bolt Brunswick label, I guess. But here we have it on the very rare, nice condition reissue label. In fact, let's look and see what shape that's in. Oh, look at that. Ooh, that's one of the nicer records we've seen. How about one of these back here, Jack? Oh, look at that. Wow. That's just an edge chip to, I don't know, 20 grooves or so. You can get some music out of that. Who's complaining? I'd rather have an edge chip like that than a record that's broken in half. I always said that. Okay. Let's quit so, horsing around. So what's going on? Let's quit here. horsing around. We don't care about those records. It's not the records. It's the album. Look at this album, Mountain Frolic. Have you ever seen that before? Well, I mean, chances well, are that a lot of collectors have. Have you ever seen the spine? I could use one. Look at that. Somebody's nicely written the tunes on this side. I wonder who did that. Somebody. What could this be all about, Jack? I don't know. Let's all open it up and find out. <gasps> what is this? Why don't you read that to us? November 13th, 47, to us Guthrie's from Alan Lomax and his folks. This is one album of records that it's hard to beat, Woody Guthrie. So presumably, Alan Lomax gave this to the Guthrie's, and then Woody uh, added a whole bunch of his own <laughs> little uh, notations and art in here. Yeah, this is cool. So, so on this date, Alan Lomax gave this album to the Guthrie's, but he says, and his folks. So. Uh, maybe it was Alan Lomax and his folks who gave him the record album, which would have meant his father, John Lomax, I, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if that, or if it's that or just the, the other people from, like, the Library of Congress or... or yeah, Ash, who knows? Or Ash or Yeah, what? That's, that's speculative. Yeah. But what we do know is that we have Alan Lomax, we have Woody Guthrie, and what's really cool about this, if that wasn't cool enough, is that... Uh, Woody has done a little little uh, record art and commentary inside on the sleeves. So this uh, fruit jar drinkers. Uh, so it was sail away, ladies. Uh, this uh, so he just write, writes the uh, the title Dave Macon fruit jar drinkers. Uh, <laughs> he puts his little comments down here. Maybe that's like an alternate verse that gets belted out during the late night jam session. A little so. art session, uh, WG uh, inscription down below. Wow. Uh, here we got more, more commentary. 
What does it say? Good loping fiddle, or do you, or do you saw two fiddles at the same time? Glad to hear you rattle the bones. I like, or I I rattle mine some. What do you got through? <laughs> Fine, but I'll sing you my vulgar version one of these nights. What do you got through? Vulgar version of Al Hopkins' Cluck Old Hen. I wonder what he could possibly turn that title into. Here, wait, <laughs> wait, sure, uh, I can't see the thing in oh, the I'm video. Sorry. So. so this one says, I could sit back and listen all night to you sing these long sad ones, Buell. Buell Kazee. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he, he was, uh, all of these were Brunswick artists. All right. This is the meanest and maddest railroad bill I have ever heard, and I've heard all of your mean mad ones. What do you got through? I don't know how old you are, Dad, but I claim you're still going. What do you got through? Dad Crockett. Bradley has got a voice high and sweet like a tree full of honey for you gals to climb up after. What do you got through? So this is just pretty cool. And um, as far as the records are concerned, you know, they're throwaways. Yeah, like one of the records in there doesn't even really belong with the set originally. But apparently, it, I mean, it's written about on the sleeves, I think. So So we leave. we just left the records with it. Uh, you could probably uh, upgrade those. Since these are the reissue, you could find this set without too much difficulty and get yourself some decent copies of these records. But that... But then they wouldn't be, you know, Woody Guthrie's records. Well, I wouldn't suggest that they would throw these away. Oh, sure, sure. But just to have them to play and listen to while you're reading the uh, commentary, I think would be kind of cool. All right, so that's kind of neat. That's been sitting around the shop for a long time, and it's time that it found itself a new home. All right, so this record here is uh, a, a very, very rare recording. For those of you who are historical collectors, uh, this is something that you might want to seriously consider. You will probably not run across another copy of it. Nations Forum did a series of 26 12-inch discs of speeches uh, right around the period of uh, World War I late World War I, towards the end of the World War I, to uh, 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 the founding of the League of Nations and so forth, early 20s, and, uh, and those, those were commercially released. Uh, they didn't sell a whole lot of copies because not many people cared to buy speeches of people, but, uh, but they turn up. Um, but, this, but Nations Forum also issued some things that were not issued commercially and were only made for very limited distribution in political meetings and, and that sort of thing. Uh, this is a copy of a record I've never seen before. I've never heard of it. This is uh, by John David Rockefeller Jr., son of the, the big man. Uh, and he was a chairman of the United War Work Campaign Committee. And so here he is uh, raising money uh, on behalf of soldiers right after the war ended uh, in November of 1918, and he, uh, he's trying to just raise money to provide entertainment and help to these guys in between the time that uh, the recording was made and when they finally got back stateside because there was still a lot of, a lot of uh, wrapping up to do in Europe and a lot of, uh, a lot of issues to be dealt with. So that's, that, that was the purpose of this recording. It's a paste-over label the green label's paste over it, and then it's got a paste over circle on top of the green label. Uh, so it's actually a double paste over like that record we had seen before. It's single sided, well, it's, it's two sided, but the flip side it has a uh, march on it like a typical 12 inch Nations Forum would have. And we, uh, we did play this record in the Bitter Request Show. This has a $2,500 minimum bid. If you collect Nations Forum, this will probably be your only opportunity to pick this record up. Okay, now let's uh, look at a couple of totally different things. We have a run of Titan uh, radio transcriptions in this auction. These are West Coast pressings. Titan was located in San Francisco. 
uh, they originally or they they derived from the uh, the Flexo and New Flexo uh, company, which started out in Kansas, Kansas City. Uh, but anyway, they did a lot of uh, radio work and they did a lot of uh, special pressings and also some uh, film soundtrack uh, material as well. And here's uh, Soul Bright and his Holly Wyans, uh, lot number 1208 for $100 minimum bid. Some of our Titans do not have a Titan label, they just have a, a white label. Sometimes there's information written on them, sometimes there isn't. $1209, $100 minimum bid, that's probably also, yeah, these are all Soul Bright Hawaiians, $100 minimum bid. And here we have yet another, this time with the Titan label. A lot of your Hawaiian uh, or your Titans are uh, kind of warped. As you can see, this is dish warped. So they're and, made out of acetate, aren't they? Um, or something like that. Yeah, I think technically these actually are acetate. And like uh, acetate film, they do tend to, to warp over time to kind of get a little gnarly. But they, they dish warp, so so they play actually pretty well. It's not that your stylus is going like up and down. It's just kind of riding an incline or, or going down an incline, I guess. Uh, what they do have is this uh, granular stuff, which does clean off. And a lot of these were very grainy, but we spent a lot of time cleaning these records. And we were able to get all of that off, so they play really, really nicely. Um, unlike the uh, palmitic acid that we see, we noticed on the instantaneous records earlier, uh, I don't know that this graininess is going to come back now that we've cleaned it off. Um, so that's we have a, a number of these Titan recordings. There are just three yeah, examples. There's, there's some good stuff on those. I mean, a lot of them are yeah, kind of like you know your average radio show with some light comedy. It's all specific to the West Coast, so that's kind of cool if you're into that. And then also, but there is some um, really obscure, not anywhere else recorded or released ethnic stuff. And there's a little jazz here and there. Um, so be sure to look carefully through that section because there's a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah, some of them are uh, music transcriptions and some of them are actual radio shows. So there's both. Okay, then uh, we have two uh, Brunswick recordings of uh, Amos and Andy radio shows. These are This was the first syndicated radio program. Uh, they were issued on these 12-inch shellac uh, pressings, initially by the Marsh Autograph label, then later by Brunswick. This is show number 361 from uh, May 20th. May 20th what? What's the lot number? Prob uh, lot number is 1239. Jack's going to look it up. So uh, so they're just blank labels. Uh, uh, 29. 1929. So it's May, tw May 20th, 1929. Radio material from the 20s is basically, I mean, if you find a copy of something, you're probably the only one who has a copy of that. Um, it's that rare. Now, the, the Amos and Andy uh, transcriptions do turn up from time to time. But there is by no means a complete run of them. There are a lot of missing shows. Uh, so it's always cool when a cache of these turns up somewhere to see if they may fill in some slots. Amos, Amos and Andy was a fabulously pro, uh, popular program. It was popular both with blacks and whites. And Corel Gosden and... Uh, Gosden and Corel. Corel. I know this like my own kids. What was the name of my kids? Anyway, um... You guys know who it is I'm talking about. They were uh, they were really nice guys. Everybody loved and respected them. Very, very much the gentleman. Uh, so anyway, here is a second uh, example, lot number 1240 uh, of episode 382. And each one of these records is a two-part show. Okay, then we have a couple of uh, vinyl pressings of one sort or another in the historical uh, section. And uh, here is a uh, Disc Ideal uh, recording out of the operatic section for $50 by, uh, looks like, a Monsieur Nivet. Here is a set by the Amar Quartet of uh, Mozart's uh, Quartet in F minor. And this is as a $50 minimum bid on the uh, Charles Plata gramophone label. And 
This looks like it's out of order. Here's going back to the historical section. This is Newton Baker on Nations Forum, the League of Nations. Um, it says a $500 minimum bid. This is another recording that was not issued in the regular issued, uh, commercially issued series. This is uh, Warren G. Harding when he was senator on the League of Nations. This was issued as one of those 26 uh, commercially issued recordings, and therefore this only has a $50 minimum bid, but it does have a special gold label, which is more of a presentation thing as opposed to the labels that we normally see uh, the 12-inch Nations Forum records appearing with, usually with the uh, speaker's picture. All right. Oh, this is cool. I forgot about this. This is the National Vocarium. Uh, dedicated to the, does that say preservation? Dedicated to the perpetuation of the living voice. Okay, the perpetuation of the living voice. So uh, that, that's the National Vocarium. And uh, this album has a write-up on National Vocarium here. And uh, the history of the label and how it was founded... Uh, by Robert Vincent, he's the one who actually wrote this up, and his library, of his uh, archive of recordings went to Michigan State University, I'm thinking, MSU, if I'm not mistaken. It says in the catalog, you can read I it there. I think that's what you had there. Um, and in this particular album has all these different recordings. Here's uh, William Howard Taft, The Rights of Labor, uh, Thomas Alva Edison, A Humorous Story, this is probably the liver story, which uh, at one point was issued within the last 20 or 30 years on, an, on a new cylinder. Uh, here is a, a fireside chat by Woodrow Wilson. The Discovery of the North Pole by Robert Edwin Peary. A Message to the American Boy by Theodore Roosevelt. So, and all of these records have a description on the back that tells about that recording. So this, uh, I think this may have been the very first National Vocarium issue. Many other records were issued after this uh, of all kinds of famous historical personalities, uh, political individuals, uh, uh, sports figures, uh, musicians and artists of various sorts. So it's a really cool label to collect because there's just so much interesting things on it, so many interesting things on it. Uh, these records are listed in the catalog individually because they're all kind of expensive records. But they are also issued or offered as a set with the album. I would hate to break this album up, but I'm not going to sell uh, the album for $500 when I could get $1,000 for the records uh, sold individually. So that's how it goes. If they do sell as a set, then the album will come with them. If they don't sell as a set, uh, I'll contact the five guys who won the records and ask them uh, if they're interested in the album, and I'll, I'll uh, offer it to them. So anyway, that's, uh, that's how that's going. And then we had one other album, uh, which was a Paul Whiteman Potato Head album. I don't know that we can really put our hands on it easily. Uh, you don't have to worry about it, Jack, if oh, you can't. It's easy. All right, so Jack's going to pull that. Um, you don't see uh, Potato Head record albums very often, but uh, this is kind of cool. This is Gershwin's uh, Piano Concerto. Uh, this is uh, sometimes turns up uh, as you know uh, individual records, but it's nice to have the uh, nice uh, original album that goes with that. I think it has notes, too. Yes, it does have notes. Um, right there. Look at that. Little pocket and everything. Uh, it uh, this is this is not uh, Gershwin on piano like uh, his earlier recording with Gershwin for Rhapsody in Blue. Gershwin was playing piano. This is Roy Barge on on piano. It's an, uh, a, an arrangement especially for Paul Whiteman by Ferdy Grofe, and uh, just a really nice set. And we did play the first uh, side of this set in the uh, Bitter Request show. And there's something kind of strange going on here with the catalog numbers. I'm not going to get into it here, but if you uh, listen to the Bitter Request Show, you will uh, hear more about that. And we do have the uh, the blue Batwing Victor of the uh, Rhapsody in Blue that Kurt just mentioned, too, in this auction. 
Oh, that's cool. So if you're looking for that, go get it. That's that's the very first recording of Rhapsody in Blue. All right, so here we go. Uh, quickly now, back to our uh, historical records section. Thirty-two, seventeen hundred dollars. This is a a gas attack. Uh, a I don't. This is not a field recording. It's not a. Uh, it's not like you're hearing somebody experiencing a gas attack, but we do have that coming up here shortly. I certainly don't want to hear anybody having a gas attack. Or, yeah, exactly. All right, another uh, uh, Nations Forum. Special gold label, but one out of the uh, series of 26, $50 minimum bid on that. Here's a divine service on a battlefield which is kind of a uh, situational, what they call a descriptive uh, novelty or something. Uh, I don't even know why that's in here. It uh, doesn't have a special minimum bid on it. But this is the one I was referring to a moment ago, gas shell bombardment, uh, Royal Garrison Artillery. This was actually recorded in, during World War I uh, on the front lines, and you can hear the guys uh, loading the, chambering the shells, firing them off and, and hearing the shells whizzing, and I guess whizzing by as well. So this is a very, very interesting recording. We have played this on a previous Bitter Request show, we, so we didn't do it this time. But uh, a very desirable record, because to have a record taken in those kinds of conditions that long ago, over 100 years ago, that was a, that was a real recording feat. And for these guys to have lugged their material over there in order to make this recording, uh, you know, that's, that was a, some pretty scary and dangerous circumstances. And one of the guys, and I can't remember who it is, was it Fred Gaysberg's brother? Will Gaysberg, perhaps? I don't know. Again, my memory is, you know, I don't remember. But I believe one of, them, one of the guys who was there involved with this, uh, the gas caused them to catch pneumonia and they wound up dying from it. So... Just a, a really interesting recording on several different levels. Uh, this has a $300 minimum bid. This is not the original issue of this. You'll see it says here, historical record, see British, uh, British record catalog. So this is uh, uh, a later pressing, but it's still very, very rare, very desirable, well worth the $300 it will sell. Uh, and... Uh, Moving along, here's another National Vocarium. This is a tribute to Robert Burns by James Ramsey, Ramsey MacDonald. Here is National Vocarium. Rip Van Winkle Returns by Joseph Jefferson. Joseph Jefferson was a very old man at the time that this was made already. He recorded this in 1899. He was a stage performer and he was known for his representation of Rip Van Winkle and uh, toured around just doing that. Uh, lot number 3230, another $50 minimum bid, three English kings. So here we have the voices of King George V, King Edward VIII, and King George VI. All right. Uh, Nellie Melba says farewell at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, London, June 8, 1926. And Ernestine Schumann-Heinck speaks to a mother about children in 1935. All right. There are certain things that we know about some of these recordings that Mr. Benson was not aware of at the time. Uh, I won't go into that. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, here is uh, William Jennings Bryan discusses immortality, preceded by Ira D. Sankey singing one of his famous hymns in 1900. That is a $50 minimum bid National Vocarium. Here is uh, William Ewart Gladstone. Sent to America be a phonogram and prefaced by Colonel George E. Giroux, 1888. A personal greeting to uh, Thomas Edison. This uh, is a very, very early uh, recording taken by uh, Colonel Giroux there in, uh, or Giroux. I guess, in, uh, in England. Uh, he had a uh, early Class M Edison cylinder phonograph and uh, recorded a number of very famous people. 
And there was a uh, book recently written about his story by uh, my friend Howard Hope, a uh, phonograph dealer there in London. Okay, lot number 3234 for $150. This is A Woman's Place in Science by Amelia Earhart in uh, 1936. It says, America's First Lady of Aviation. Florence Nightingale, the voice of Florence Nightingale, speaking uh, greeting posterity and her comrades of ba Balaclava on July 7th, 1890. Lot number 3235 for $100. That also was taken from a cylinder recording. I have some comrades that like baklava. Do you? Yeah. yeah I wouldn't want to eat any from 1890, though. Yeah. The Gospel of Wealth by Andrew, Car Andrew Carnegie. Uh, General Voices from History. Also a Robert Vincent uh, enterprise. This pressed by Victor, and we have the uh, RCA Victor uh, spiderweb back. Uh, another general voices from history, Will Rogers pays his respects to bankers and other timely topics, so this is probably just taken off of his Victor recording. Not everything on this particular label is going to be terribly rare. Here's a voice of uh, Marconi. I'm not going to pronounce his first name. I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it, Jack. 32 38 $50. All right. And here is William McKinley. $50. And this gets the blue notes, 12 inch blue notes I mentioned earlier, $50 for uh, Earl Father Hines. So he was called Father at least as early as this, Jack. 4873 is the lot number. Here's 48. It's a dupe. 73 dupe. Oh, one's yellow and one's white. How about that? Which will you get? Who knows? Lot number 5075 E minus. This is a $50 minimum bid of Red Nichols and his orchestra. I'll see you in my dreams, and some of these days, this is out of our uh, gem quality section, your 20,000 series uh, Brunswick uh, here's uh, the, recordings. Here's uh, the Paul Whiteman thing I was talking about. Okay, Rhapsody in Blue, Paul Whiteman with the composer at the piano, $75 minimum bid, E minus condition, very, very nice shape, lot number 5450. All right, I think it's, was that 5430? 5430, we have two E minus copies of that, so two bidders will wind up with copies of that record. All right, that takes care of all of our 12 inches. Actually, it takes care, I hope, of all of our 78s, period. Now let's go to the last discs in the catalog, our diamond discs. Uh, we have only one diamond disc that we're going to feature out of the regular commercially issued diamond disc records. We do have some nice, some very nice... Uh, commercially issued diamond discs in the 51 and 52,000 series. Uh, we're not going to pull those out due to time, but we are going to show a few uh, very special ones. This is uh, Polka de WR, piano solo by Sergei Rachmaninoff, and it is autographed by him right across this uh, white field on the lower half of the label. This is a very significant record for some very interesting reasons. Rachmaninoff made his very first recordings for the Edison Company in uh, uh, 1919 and uh, he had just come over from Russia. He just immigrated to the United States uh, and um, was getting his start. Uh, he made a series of sides. This is the very last side that he recorded and the very last take of that side. So this was the last recording he made for Edison. He never came back to the Edison studios. Edison did not care much for Mr. Rachmaninoff's playing. And Rachmaninoff went on to become a, uh, an exclusive Victor recording artist and of course uh, did quite well for himself both as pianist and uh, uh, composer. He uh, actually autographed this record I think in, in, yeah, in 1925 and we can see that because there's a little date code here uh, under the Edison label. And so uh, by the time he autographed this uh, record, uh, he had already been a Victor recording artist for some time. So here he is as a Victor recording artist, but somebody walked up and said, hey, would you autograph this record for me? And he did. And uh, it's, in, it's in beautiful shape, E condition. Let's just go ahead and take it out and look. Um, 
just a glorious record. A Rachmaninoff signature on a letter or a postcard or something is going to set you back 500 to 1000 bucks. How much more cool is it to have his signature on one of his very first Edison recordings? How many Edison records could have possibly been, possibly been autographed by Rachmaninoff? I mean, any? I mean, probably, but where are you going to see another one? Especially in this condition. Just glorious. We played this on the Bitter Request Show. We talked about it at length, uh, and I talk about it at length in the catalog. There's more interesting things to say about that, but you can read it for yourself or buy you the Bitter uh, Request Show. You can gaze upon its splendor on the front cover of the catalog. That's right. Where's my catalog? Oh, going? where's your catalog? Where's my catalog? Going? Oh my gosh. Well, I showed it earlier. No, you, you guys know what it looks like. It's under. Okay. Uh, here is another really cool... We started selling my... Uh, Edison special pressings out of the archive last auction and has some really cool ones in that auction. We we have some really cool ones here as well. Here is direct wire telegraph message for W.C. Brown sent from Chicago, Illinois to the Edison studio, Orange, New Jersey, recorded directly on the phonograph Mr. Marvin Hewitt sender, that is the telegraph sender, July 25th 1922 recording personally supervised by Thomas A. Edison. And then here is written prop for property of uh, J. What does that say? H.A. Uh, Huber, Calexico. So H.A. Huber was probably a telegrapher who wanted a copy of this record. He lived in Calexico, California, and he uh, wrote his name on there. I had no idea how these records, why they were made for whom they were made, how they were sold, until somebody, was it you, Jack, found this? Uh, well, there was a result on Google Books for a back issue of like a Telegrapher's trade magazine. So that shed a little light on it. It shed a lot of light on it. There was a little blurb in this trade magazine that said, there are three Telegraph recordings that are for sale for a dollar, I think a dollar fifty $1. cents $1. or something. Uh, but if you bought all three of them, you'd get a, a break. And this is one of those telegraph records. So they were actually sold commercially to the telegraph fraternity. So I did not like know that. Mail order. But by mail order. Yeah, this is probably not something you would have found in your Edison dealer's uh, shop unless he had some kind of telegraphic connection. So we tried to find somebody to decode it, but we couldn't yet. So... So this is a series of clicks. It's Morse code, but it's kind of different. Morse code is dots and dashes. This is just a bunch of clicks. And uh, so, so, it, so Jack, you can download an app that will decode Morse, Morse code for you, but it couldn't do anything with that. All it could discern was a bunch of E's and I's. So we've got a guy working on this right now to try and decode it for us. And... Um, and we did record this, and we will put it on the Bitter Request show as in the bonus hours uh, with the translation, if we can get that, uh, within the next couple of weeks. So we'll see how that goes. All right. Just a really, really cool record. Here's another record that's interesting. I've had uh, another one or two copies of this. This is an address by Sidney K. Powell, uh, reading a piece out of the Etude magazine, uh, that uh, Thomas Edison had written, and was and it's called Mr. Edison on the Essentialness of Music. Another single-sided pressing, engraved label. Uh, this is not Edison himself speaking. It's Mr. Powell reading the article that Edison wrote. This has a $500 minimum bid. Uh, the previous lot has a $250 minimum bid, which would be a steal. And that Rachmaninoff, if I didn't uh, mention it, has a $1,000 minimum bid. All right, next up is Greetings from the Bunch at Orange. We had this in the last catalog. You saw it there. I won't say anything more about it. That's lot number 6322 with a $100 minimum bid. Lot number 6323 is another uh, vanity uh, pressing uh, that Edison did. This is... Rounded Up in Glory, A Cowboy Spiritual by uh, Harlan S. Gates. Made special for Mr. Gates, it says. I guess Oscar J. Fox is the, uh, the composer. Uh, yeah, here we have The Old Road, uh, apparently written by John P. Scott. 
and again sung by Harlan S. Gates. So another basically brand new record, E, E minus condition for $250. Uh, you can count the number of special pressings that Edison did on uh, almost on both hands and bo both feet. Between Jack and I, we have enough hands and feet to cover anything known. Well, okay. Any Maybe anything known, because, you know, Ray Weil, who wrote the discography on this stuff, did have access to the Edison National Historic Site, so uh, there's just not much of this kind of stuff out there. All right, here we got William H. Atkins. Uh, there was a series of... No, I take it back. This is something different. Forget what I just said. Um, William H. Atkins joined the Edison Company on December 1st, 1887, and this record, which is being re uh, recited by Mr. Edgar, who was Mr. Atkins' assistant, uh, is commemorating 35 years of service by Mr. Atkins. And so he's just talking about what a great guy he is. He's known as the boss. He's been around for 35 years. He knows all the secrets in the uh, laboratory, all that kind of stuff. And there was a, I found something online in a, in a magazine, uh, an Edison publication at, at the time, which talks about the banquet that they threw for Mr. Atkins and all the wonderful things that was said and different stories. So it's, it's kind of cool. There is a history about this record uh, if you want to do the research on it and pull it up. Uh, it's just having a blank label area except that it's written in script special 841-1-1. That would be the matrix number by Mr. Edgar. That's the only clue that you have on the record as to what it is. A single-sided record, $500 minimum bid, a Stunning collect, uh, collector's item for any Edison uh, collector. That, that's something you'd want to have in your collection. Now we have a section of uh, Edison test pressings. Here is a test pressing. Uh, no labels as, as you usually find them with just information written on the uh, white under paper uh, label. Stamp discarded. These things were discarded and dug out of the trash by Edison employees. They weren't really supposed to do that, but they did anyway. Uh, lot number 6326, $50. Uh, this is just an interesting record. It's oversized. And you'll sometimes find crimp marks around the edges of early Edison pressings. This one has six long crimp marks that go around it like this. You see that, Jack? Yep. It will pick that up. So that's just kind of weird. It's The edge is unfinished. It's not polished down. So this is a test pressing of some sort. Maybe a test pressing not so much for the content of the record, but for uh, uh, looking at various ways of producing and manufacturing diamond discs. Uh, here's under the Double Eagle March, special pressing uh, by, a, by the band, Edison band, presumably. Here's a piano solo on the flip side. I don't know uh, if this was actually issued, but uh, it has a $50 minimum bid. Oh. Here's something neat about this. I don't know if you can pick this up, but if you can get the light right, it's written under the double right across here. So the label kind of covers up a lot of information on this. So I don't think that this was an issued recording because you would not have seen that uh, on a regular issued diamond disc. Can you catch that? Uh, you're going to have to move it somehow. There you go. All right, and we don't see any writing on that side. Okay, this is a possibly unissued take by Andre Benoist on uh, piano. Uh, some takes were issued on lot number five or uh, Edison five o nine eight o. Nothing very terribly important there. And uh, this is a test pressing of Frankie Marvin's Poor Man's Blues which would have been issued on 52490 in electric rec recording. Uh, and this has a $50 minimum bid. And that concludes the, uh, the discs for this auction. Uh, one, uh, one thing that is interesting on here, that A and B, so it's the same song on both sides by uh, Frankie Marvin. One side is take A, one side is take B. So it's kind of cool to find uh, two different takes on the same record on an Edison Diamond disc. We are going to tackle the cylinder section. We always have a very large number of cylinders in our auctions. This is no uh, different. 
uh, and we always have some pretty important and special items. So that's what we're going to look at right now. We're going to begin with the very first cylinder in the auction. In our brown wax cylinder category, this is lot number 6330, Tom Marshall and the Demijohn, which is a North American cylinder. So here we have a brown wax cylinder. Not all, all North Americans are like this, but many of them will have this kind of a uh, recessed edge. Um, originally, there would have been a little circular piece of paper that would have gone into this uh, channel rim, which, we, which is what we call it today. They would have the information, and because this, the cylinders are a wax material, they don't really stick, and so they. Have you ever uh, seen one of these paper labels? Oh yeah, yeah, but they are very rare. Uh, very, very seldom does does the paper ring ever really stick in there and stay with the cylinder. Uh, so you got to generally listen to it to figure out what it is. Uh, but since these are generally announced, that's usually not an issue. Uh, this is a uh, beautiful cylinder. You can see that there's no mold on there. Uh, just in gorgeous condition. It plays very well. We played it uh, on the Bitter Request show. You can hear it. Uh, it grades 8 to 9 uh, audibly on a scale of, of 0 to 9. So it's uh, about as good as, as we could give it. Um, what's well, there are a lot of really cool things about this. It was recorded very possibly uh, in uh, around 1893, and uh, or at least it, or around that period of time. And I say that because we have two original slips that come with this cylinder. I'm not going to take them out of the baggie. Hopefully you can see it. Is it reflecting off the bag? It's it's all right. I can. It's okay. We get the idea. All right. So we have the title written on, the, on each slip. And then down here we have some information that's kind of cryptic, but we have a date. So here we have June 10th, 93 on this one, June 12th over here on this one. Um, and then some, uh, some numbers, which uh, my friend Michael Conchalian uh, suggested that that might be, uh, what did he say? Uh, diaphragm? Information about the, yeah, the recording. I think he was. He, he suggested that might be diaphragm thicknesses, uh, which which sounds uh, very uh, uh, possible. So anyway, this cylinder apparently appears to have been used to to record other cylinders. So that's generally the way the way they would have made duplicate copies. They would have had a few machines set up for when the performer did did his thing or the band played their deal. And then they would, those master cylinders would be used to record to other cylinders by dubbing them. And so this very likely was one of those master cylinders that was used to, uh, to dub other cylinders. And to find, I've never seen record slips like this before. I'm sure at the Edison Laboratory there may still be some of these laying around, but I ne certainly don't know of any in private hands. Uh, so this this is a very very cool cylinder. It actually has two recordings on it, two anecdotes by uh, Tom Marshall. Tom Marshall, at that time, was a an orator who would go around and uh, stump well, for political candidates. Are they anecdotes about Tom Marshall or by Tom Marshall? Uh, I don't remember what the second uh, <laughs> anecdote was. The but uh, it was about him going to eat at uh, somebody's house. But um, I was just, I was just wondering. You know, we don't want to say that it's by him, if it, uh, if it ain't. Well, it, okay, it was about him. I mean, these are stories about him. About so, him. so you're right. So, it, okay. So I see your clarification. That's that's correct. So uh, yeah, these are two stories about uh, Tom Marshall, and uh, as I was saying, Tom Marshall was a. Uh, a guy would go around stumping for political candidates on the Democrat ticket. And uh, later on, he became uh, vice president uh, for eight years under Woodrow Wilson, I believe. He's also elected governor of Indiana in 1908. There you go. So he went on to a pretty distinguished political career. This is not him speaking. It's somebody else, but somebody else speaking about him before he became uh, that uh, well-known on a national level. So that, uh, that's, that is a very, very interesting and significant recording. Uh, we've got a $7,500 minimum bid on that. And somebody's going to really enjoy it. One of the best things about it is that it's funny. It yeah, is funny. The stories that they talk about on there are actually, they hold up. 
<laughs> it's even funnier when you have Jackson around to help you understand what it is that you're hearing because my hearing isn't all that good. And I was trying to figure out what he said. And uh, Jackson came up with a word and it's like, oh, yeah, okay. Now, now I get it. It's now like it's funny. Playing a crossword puzzle. But if you listen to the Bitter Request show, you'll know what we're talking about, and uh, we'll we'll explain all that. Okay, the next slot is uh, in the catalog is Sousa's band doing the Yazoo dance, and that is lot number sixty-three thirty-one. That's announced uh, as Washington D.C. And that would date the cylinder to about 1896, so also very, very early. It's got some mold there that you can see on the edge, but the cylinder surface itself is beautiful. Look at this. It's just got some very light mold right around the extreme edges, but not into the recording. Uh, a couple of, you know, little pinpoints that are not, they're totally negligible. Just a, a beautiful cylinder, brown wax cylinder, very, very early. Uh, and... Neat thing about this, it has two record slips. Look at this. So here you have Yazoo Dance, number 1050, Chicago Talking Machine Company down here. Sousa's Grand Concert Band plays Yazoo Dance, number 1050. Isn't that wonderful? And then here is another record slip. Sousa's Grand Concert Band, Yazoo Dance. And I've had a few of these double slip cylinders. That's uh, very unusual uh, and, and just wonderful to get them. Uh, I should mention that we... We did play this, uh, we played all four of these brown wax during the course of the show. Uh, this one uh, was recorded at 140 RPM, and our previous one that we looked at was 100 RPM. Uh, eventually, uh, cylinder speed settled out to about 160 RPM in the early 1900s. Okay, our next lot uh, in the catalog was lot number 6332. This brown wax cylinder is Columbia... New York and London, which dates it around 1900. Uh, this is catalog number, uh, Columbia catalog number 11099, and the 11,000 series was uh, spoken word uh, kind of stuff. This is called Artemis Ward's Panoramic Lecture Among the Mormons. The, uh, the speaker is not identified, uh, but again, it's in very nice condition. It's got a little bit more mold on it than we saw uh, previously, but again, very, very light, not going to sound too much. Uh, we, we gave this an eight on our scale of, uh, zero to nine in terms of its audio quality. So you'll be very happy with this. It's very easy to understand. Artemis Ward was, uh, considered to be Americans, America's first stand up comedian. He died in the late 1860s, but he had, uh, taken a tour through the uh, uh, through Utah and hung out at Salt Lake City for a while, met uh, uh, Joseph Smith, who was one of the big you know uh, founders of the uh, Church of Latter Day Saints, and uh, and and really spent some time there and and got a whole feel for what the whole Mormon experience was like, and he developed this quote lecture. Uh, about this particular trip, and it was illustrated this by this big slideshow that was on scroll, uh, one huge scroll, and stagehands behind the scenes would roll the scroll to the ne next uh, picture to illustrate that part of his talk. It it must have been a real hoot to hear him, and I I read a lot about him on the internet, and I actually read the full script of his uh, panoramic. Uh, lecture about the Mormons, and it's, uh, it's worth tracking down. Okay, the last brown wax cylinder we have, oh, by the way, that was a minimum bid of $1,000. We played that at 120 RPM. And this next cylinder, we also played at 120 RPM. This is a uh, lot 6333. Uh, this is George W. Johnson doing uh, the Whistling Coon. And I'm sure many of our listeners and viewers know something about George W. Johnson, a very, very prominent, uh, successful uh, black entertainer at that time who basically made his career just recording three or four songs for these various companies, starting very early on in the early 1890s, uh, recording for North American companies, and then uh, even into the disc era. 
But uh, a very nice condition copy of this cylinder, a little edge chip here on the bottom that doesn't get into the playing grooves at all. And we played this on the show. Like I say, we played this at 120 RPM. Uh, this has a $1,500 minimum bid. This uh, was uh, recorded by the U.S. Phono Company of New Jersey. Here is a uh, record, original record slip that goes along with that. So the four brown wax cylinders that we have in this catalog are some of the nicest and most historically important brown wax cylinders that we have ever sold. So uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I hope you've been saving your money. Now, if you are interested in Lambert cylinders, and we know that a lot of our customers are, we have a very, very interesting selection of those as well, and those begin next with lot number 6335. And we're going to look at one, the American Quartet, doing the sidewalks of New York uh, in a nice purple color. Now, I don't have a pink Lambert here to compare this to. You guys are probably familiar with them, and they are truly a very nice, bright pink color. This is not pink. This, if I was just to hold this up, you would think I was holding a, an Edison purple Amberol. That's the color this is. Uh, so Lamberts did come in different colors. Pink and black are the most commonly encountered, but rarely you will see other colors. Uh, this is an early example of a Lambert. It's got the flat white uh, rim with uh, three little wedges inside here that help to guide it onto the mandrel when you're sliding it on so uh, the edge doesn't catch. Uh, this also is interesting because it has on the inside, I don't know if you can see this, Jack, but I don't, know, I don't know if I can see it either. You know what? You can't see it. But if you, uh, if you go to the auction highlights page on 78rpm.com, there is a picture of the inside of this cylinder where it is stamped. Simon, uh, Simon S. Kaufman agent on the inside. So it does have that stamp on the inside of the cylinder. Uh, very cool cylinder and it's got a $250 minimum bid. The next Lambert cylinder that we have is uh, the Municipal Band of um, Milan and this is a Lambert the likes of which you very likely have never seen. This is a red Lambert. Now this is an English produced Lambert. Unfortunately it has shrunk over the years and this top piece was uh, broken off and kind of poorly re-glued back on it unfortunately. But it's the only red Lambert I've ever seen and uh, it's, a type, it's a later type that has a core uh, but still a very very cool example it comes in this uh, British uh, elephant box, which is also nice in and of itself. And a minimum bid on that is $100. Then uh, 6337 is a brown Lambert. Let's see here, brown Lambert. That goes here. Brown Lambert is, is in this uh, Edison Bell indestructible uh, box. And, uh, okay, perhaps this was before Edison, no, here it is, Edison Bell. Yeah, Edison Bell Consolidated Phonograph Company. All right, so here we have the uh, Brown Lambert. Now, this is a ty earlier type without the core, so it's like an American pink Lambert. It does not have the wedges, so it's not as early as that purple one that we looked at. Brown Lamberts were not issued in the United States. These were only produced in England, but that's the original uh cylinder with its original box. Minimum bid on that is uh, $75. Then we have another one I've never seen before, lot 6338, which is a modeled Lambert. Look at this. Kind of a puke baby food color with uh, some black mixed in. You know, I don't know if, if this was modeled when it was made or if this is a result of maybe it separating from the core underneath. I, I have no idea. Who knows? But uh, 
whatever it was, this is uh, certainly something that I am unfamiliar with. It's very similar in construction to the Red Lambert we just looked, lo looked at, but in better shape. So if you're interested in a yellow Lambert, this may be your only shot at that. This also comes with uh, one of these uh, English Lambert boxes. Minimum bid on that is $100. $100 for a ye yellow Lambert? <sighs> Jack, maybe you need to start bidding, uh, minimum bidding the catalogs. Hmm. Lot 6339 is an international phonographic language schools cylinder medical record, German record. Okay, so this is very similar to the uh, lang IPLS language school cylinders that are pretty common, uh, pressed by Lambert, Italian, Spanish, German, English, all of those uh, languages were done. But this is a German medical cylinder. So the guy on here is giving a medical talk in German. Curiously, the announcement is in English. I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but uh, there you have it. This is medical cylinder number five. Good luck completing that set. But if you just want an example, uh, that may be your only shot. I've never seen another one of those in, in the tens of thousands of cylinders, if not hundreds, that I've gone through in my career. Okay, um, now let's look at our next little group. This is a fabulous set here. I've owned this for a long, long time. This is the only lid that retains any portion of the label that had originally been attached to it. But it says, A Socialist Speech, Winning a World by Eugene Debs, uh, Parts 1 through 3, made especially for the W... Made especially for Wilshire Cook Company, 200 William Street. Well, after doing some re research, I came up with the... Uh, uh, solution to this. That should be the Wilshire Book Company, not Cook. They misprinted it on here. The Wilshire Book Company was located 200 William Street in New York. They were a socialist bookstore. Uh, so these cylinders were made specifically for them. They probably contracted to have this speech by Debs made. He was, uh, he was like the man back then in terms of American socialism. Uh, these are not uh, speeches, or there's three parts to a speech. These are not spoken by him. These are spoken by Lynn Spencer, I believe. Check here to make sure. Yeah, Lynn Spencer. Uh, but still, a fascinating and very rare set. Look at the condition of that. Just beautiful. No mold on that cylinder. Incredible condition. The, the, box, the boxes are nice. The lids are a little messed up. There's some silver fish got to them. But the cylinders themselves are beautiful. And uh, this is, uh, I believe, did Mark record these? I think that these are going to appear, I think these appear in the bonus material uh, of the uh, Bitter Request show. There are about a half a dozen very tiny little mold specks on this cylinder, but not anything of any significance. Uh, does another set of this exist? I've never seen or heard of one. Uh, and if they do, did it survive as a complete set in this condition? Kind of doubtful. Very few of these were probably made and sold. Very few. So that is another very historically interesting lot. And a minimum bid on that is $500. For what it is, that's giving them away. All right. We have a couple of... Uh, Two Minute Wax, here's the Trust Question by William Jennings Bryan. You know, again, very nice shape. Usually these uh, Bryan Taft cylinders are really nice because they hardly got any play. Um, this uh, grades E, a couple of very, very tiny little mold spots, $200 minimum bid on that. It's from 1908. That's a, uh, that was done for the 1908 presidential election between Taft and Bryan. Here is a... Uh, Edison 2 minute 10366, a two minute, a late, very late two minute cylinder by Sophie Tucker, my husband's in the city. Again, just really, really nice shape. No mold on that. Very cool cylinder. It is a little noisy, I gotta say. This the later wax used on some of these uh, later cylinders 
was a little, tended to crystallize a little bit, and you hear that in the uh, reproduction. The last records we're going to look at in the catalog are to be found on page 98. These are gem quality four minute US everlasting cylinders. I bought a US everlasting phonograph a number of years ago that one of only four US everlasting opera uh, cylinder machines known to exist. It's a beautiful machine with an outside horn on the back mount outside horn. Uh, it uh, is unique among the six known examples in that it's the only one that has an oxidized or tiger stripe bronze bed plate and fittings. Uh, very attractive, very neat machine, two four minute. Uh, it has a, the two four minute uh, US Everlasting reproducer uh, where you can turn the knob one way or another to line up either the two or four minutes uh, reproducer with a cylinder. Uh, as all of them are, that was uh, totally cracked up because they, they were made of, of pot metal originally. None of them survive. Uh, so I had that rebuilt. And uh, Paul Baker in uh, Buffalo, New York, he does this kind of work. He's an amazing uh, machinist. Cost me 5000 bucks to have that reproducer remade. But he used all the original parts that were reusable and just recreated it and uh, just did a fabulous job. But that is such a rare and significant machine. It was worth it. But that machine came with a whole bunch of two-minute and a whole bunch of four-minute U.S. Everlasting cylinders, all of them in original boxes, all of them basically new. I don't know if these things have ever been played. The machine looks like it probably hasn't been played very much either. Uh, it was probably a presentation to somebody who already had a Victor machine and was invested in disc technology, and they just probably put it in the closet and forgot about it. Uh, but this is what the boxes look like. Just beautiful boxes. Look at the lid on that thing. You don't see cylinder lids that look like that. If, if anything, they're usually just covered by, you know, decades of dust. But these things have been put in a cabinet or a box and just are just... Look at this. Yeah, I know I sound like a broken record, so to speak. But these records that I'm showing you are truly amazing. You guys who are collectors, you know, you don't go through a box of cylinders and start pulling out stuff like this. But there was a whole bunch of them, and we've listed all of them in this particular catalog. They're gem quality, okay? Uh, so this is just one example I pulled out. This is uh, Billy by Ada Jones, I Always Dream of Bill. That was the song that uh, either we, Bonnie Baker, or uh, who else? Get the other person's name. Maybe it was Wee Bonnie Baker who had a big hit on of this back in uh, I guess the late 30s or something. But anyway, uh, they all look like that. Um, there is one cylinder here in the listing, 6798, that I put in the listing, but it was not part of this collection. I got it elsewhere. It is in similarly perfect condition, but there's no information here on the label on the edge. Okay, this cylinder can be found in uh, this book. Where's my uh, cylinder book? Here we go. This book on page 201. So if you've got this book, uh, Indestructible and U.S. Everlasting Cylinders and Illustrated History and Cylinderography by uh, Alan Sutton and I, you will see on page 201 a uh, reference to this exact record. So it shows you, right here, it says, under cylinder number 1443, air by Bach, air, air for G-string, uh, by J. Louis van der Maiden, uh, a specimen of 1443 exists with a blank rim. Well, this is the cylinder that Mr. Sutton is referring to in the discography. So... Uh, Von der Maiden was an artistic director for the U.S. Everlasting Company. Uh, he formed his own band. He was a, a pretty well-respected conductor, and so that is by him and his orchestra. So that's available. That is a, uh, looks like a $100 minimum bid. 
Uh, the rest of the cylinders, with few exceptions, in this particular series are $25 minimum bid cylinders because four-minute U.S. Everlastings just don't turn up all that often. They are usually really beat up when they do turn up. Uh, to find them in this condition, just like I say, it doesn't happen. There were also some of the uh, U.S. Everlasting four-minute Grand Opera records, which came in the nice, beautiful purple boxes. Two minutes were blue boxes. I'll be running two minutes in another auction, but the four, fours are being run this time in auction 71. Nice, beautiful, original lids, nice shape. Look at that, just beautiful cylinders. We played one of these on the show, it sounded great. Um, a few of these uh, cylinders that I got with this collection did have a split down the side because the celluloid uh, is formed uh, into a tube from a sheet. So there's a, a join that's made with acetone or something. And over time, sometimes that celluloid will shrink a little bit and it will split right along that seam. You can still play the cylinder just by putting it on top of the core and putting a rubber band on either side to hold it in position. Uh, and those are noted in the catalog as uh, having a seam split, if that is indeed the case. So here we have uh, the sextet from Lucia. Uh, we have uh, a trio from Faust. We have uh, the Miserere from Mil Trovatore. Uh, those are just some of the grand opera titles. Anyway, uh, that obviously is, those cylinders are offered individually, but they are also offered, no they're not. No, they're not. Take it back. I thought that I had offered them as a lot. I offered the two-minute indestructible cylinders in the last catalog as a lot and got a pretty substantial bid for them. But the total of the individual bids on all the cylinders far exceeded the lot bid. So I didn't even putting in uh, bother putting in a lot bid on these cylinders. They are offered individually because individually they will be bringing some pretty, pretty uh, fair change. So that covers... All of the records in the catalog. We do have a big selection, larger than we've ever run in the past, of record catalogs in this uh, auction. Those catalogs start on page... Uh, let's see here. Page 103. No, those are the books. Let's see, they start on page 105. And this, these are being sold like the label collection, alphabetically by company. So we start with American Record Company, and then we go all the way through uh, Spanish Columbia. All right, so there's quite a few catalogs here, two, uh, two full pages, so probably a couple hundred catalogs, all different, uh, both American and foreign catalogs. Some uh, very common things some extremely rare things. Uh, I have not put special minimum bids on any of these catalogs. So there's like a 1901, uh, let's see, where is it? 1901 Columbia cylinder catalog in here. Uh, no special minimum bid. Minimum bid is $3. It will not sell for $3. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, you will find some uh, very obscure labels represented as well. The other thing is that these are the nicest condition record catalogs that we have encountered probably in the last 20 or 30 years. So just because we have a 1922 Victor catalog, it's not going to look like the 1922 Victor catalogs you'll see at a book and paper show. These are really generally nice. Unless they're really rare and obscure, these are going to be nice catalogs. You're going to be very happy with them, so you'll be able to do a lot of upgrading of your own collection. So the very last thing I need to mention is what we're selling as our resource catalog offerings. We are selling, because we're selling the uh, Noxion uh, label archive, or we're starting it, we are once again listing American record companies and producers. This is the book for pre-war American record labels. If you don't own a copy of this book, you need to pick it up before it goes out of print. This has a ton of information, on, not only on individual labels, but on the companies and uh, individuals behind those labels. So that, that needs to be in every 78 RPM collector's library, at least if you're collecting pre-war, pre-World War II material. Uh, the other book that we have, I don't have a copy of it here, it's the uh, 15,000 D series discography by Carrie Janelle that just came out. So if you're collecting uh, country and hillbilly stuff, uh, you're probably gonna wanna pick up a copy of that. Jack, what are we uh, selling that for? 
Uh, Carrie's book is $39. So that's $39. And uh, our cap by Alan Sutton is how much? Six, 69, 69 I think. And then uh, the only other thing that we list there, of course, is our Bitter Request Show CDs. Guys, I don't want to stress too much. Can I stress? Can you stress too much? You can't stress it enough. You cannot stress enough. The Bitter Request Show is the best deal going out there. You're going to get 15 hours of music and commentary, a few cool jokes. Some of them may not be all that funny. You might be able to pick them up and tell them at a party. You might be. Of stuff you're just not going to hear anywhere else. Uh, it's, it's great. $20 is all it costs you. $20 does not even cover my expenses to produce this show. Honestly, it takes Mark and Jack and I all week to do this. And Mark's still working on editing it right now. So, uh, this is really a labor of love, but we do it because we have such amazing records that pass through this place. And you know how you, you're a collector. Most collectors love to show off their stuff. You know, Hey, would you want, you want to come over to my place and listen to records? Like, no, you know, um, this is our opportunity to share our hobby and our enjoyment with you guys. And, uh, and, and so many of you guys are regular buyers of the show. You just subscribe to it. We send them out whenever, they, uh, whenever they're released, and, and we love that. So if you like the show and you pretty much think I'm always going to want it, then just let us know. We'll just put you down as a uh, long-term subscriber. That way you don't have to ask for it. You'll just get it with your auction winnings every time we do a catalog. So, uh, so that's basically... I think all I have to say, Jack, you have anything to say? No, just, uh, you know, bid high, bid early, and bid often. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, we don't always sell interesting records. But when we do, you're going to see them right here in the auction highlights reel. And you're going to hear them on the Radio Dismuke, Dismuke Nox Vintage Records Bitter Request Show. So with that... We're going to leave you. I hope you've enjoyed these things and uh, get your bids in. You still got plenty of time. And uh, auction closes. The auction 23rd. closes the 23rd. This is a late one, so you've got a little more time than usual. But bear in mind that weekend is Easter weekend. So you probably not, you very likely might not have a lot of time to be bidding. You may have family in town. You may have things going on. Don't put it off to the last minute. And the weekend before that is tax weekend. So you may be working on your taxes. So don't put off to down the road what you could be doing today. Go ahead and get your bids in. It doesn't hurt you to get your bids in early. Nobody knows what the bids are. You can bid $10,000 on this item, and the guy who's the last bidder in the auction has no idea. So you're not hurting yourself by bidding early. You're helping us a lot by being enabling us to get all these bids into the database yeah, you're, you're so that we can close the auction in time. You're not helping anybody by bidding late. That's true. You're only risking not getting it in. That is absolutely true. And furthermore, an early bid will break a tie. If, if you bid $10 and that guy bids $10 and your bid gets in first, you're the one who walks with a record. So there is that, uh, that thing. All right, I think that pretty well covers it. Be sure to use the online bid sheet. We've spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of money getting this thing up and running. We just turned it on last night. Um, so it is up and running. Go on 78rpm.com. You can use your existing registration uh, login information if you have that on hand uh, to log in and bid. If you haven't already registered, you'll, you can do so very quickly. We'll get you uh, up and running in no time. You will get your bids uh, when you type in a bid, you'll see the line pop up that tells you what you just bid on. So if you've made a mistake in typing the number in, you, you will know right there. So it's a fail-safe way of bidding. So you're not making mistakes. We're not making mistakes because we don't have to enter your bids. We just suck those uh, uh, bids off of the server on the Internet and dump them into our own database. So there's nothing that we have to do with it. So whatever you bid is exactly what's going to be reflected on your bid sheet. So a lot fewer mistakes that way. And uh, another thing is a lot of people, you know, obviously love to get the printed version of the catalog. But, of course, you're relying on the mail to get it to you, first of all. So sometimes guys that always get their catalog don't even get it one particular time because, you know, Joe Shlobotnik, their regular postal guy, was out that day and their sub didn't know what to do and lost your catalog. But also, if you have the digital version of the catalog, which we always publish, 
you can just search for any keyword or phrase and instantly like you know all of your records by you know blind melly jelly will pop right up and so you don't have to like a lot of people will complain that it's so so many pages and it's all such fine print i can't read it well you know just look it up on the computer then when you log into the online bid sheet you will see on the left side of your screen the pdf file which you can scroll through as you go so you're scrolling through the catalog and you're looking at stuff you see something you want you just on the right side of your screen is the is the bid field. You just type in the lot number, your bid, enter, and that posts it to, to your bid sheet. Uh, and the nice thing about the PDF file is there's a little magnifying glass up there in the title bar where you can click on that and search any character string. So if you want uh, uh, to hear uh, sidewalks of New York, you can, and, and you don't maybe know whether it's going to be New York or NY or whatever, you just type in a character string. You can type in sidewalks and it'll bring up every incident of that in the entire catalog, just one right after the other. So it's a very convenient, uh, foolproof way of searching a catalog if there are certain things that you're really looking for, whether it's artists or record labels or uh, titles or what have you. So uh, there's just a lot, to, a lot to be said for bidding online, so we encourage you to do that. Not to say that we won't take your bids either by mail, fax, uh, email, or whatever. We just would like it if you would give the online bid sheet a try and, uh, and do it that way. Just saves us all a lot of work and headache. Okay, I think that's it. On behalf of the whole Knox Vintage Records team, myself, Jack, Lucinda, Cookie, uh, Mark, who's still working for us even out in the wilds of Tennessee, came down here and recorded the Bitter Request show with us. Uh, is still going to be working with us in various capacities. So uh, we all thank you for your uh, patronage of our uh, organization, and uh, we hope that you're going to win some great stuff to add to your class, uh, collection. May God bless and keep you, and we'll be in touch.